Hello and welcome to a Market Muse webinar, How User Intent Changes the SEO and Content Game. Um, and before I introduce our guest host, uh, I wanted to just do a few uh, housekeeping things. Um, we have a QA. and uh, a Kevin and I, as I'll introduce him in a minute, will be answering any questions you have that relate to content strategy, search engine optimization, that relate to you know, user intent, task completion, and any of the topics that we talk about. Or if you have any questions for us uh, individually. Um, so just put them in the Q&A box and my colleagues, Elizabeth and Roger, will be uh, setting them up for Kevin and I to field. Um, and like I mentioned, I'm going to introduce uh, the head of SEO. With, he has a focus on all areas of SEO, um, but has a real, real strong, uh, uh, strong work in the technical SEO space. It's Kevin Indig. Um, and so thank you for joining us today, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Pleasure to um, be on. And Kevin works with Atlassian. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Atlassian, they... They, uh, they own a lot of great brands and, and you know, you're, probably your development team uh, is, knows every single one of them and can spout them off. We are Confluence uh, users and lovers. Uh, and, uh, but what, what are the other sites that you manage, Kevin, uh, just to get, get a, give everybody an idea for the types of things that you're optimizing, types of content that you're working with and types of technical challenges that you face? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have about 13 sites total, ranging mm -hmm. from just a couple hundred pages to a couple million pages. Mm -hmm. Most of them are products like Trello, Bitbucket, Jira, as you mentioned, Confluence, and then there's a, uh, there's a whole set of other uh, products. And so we, we have different types of content as well. Mm -hmm. We have product pages, we have a community, we have a marketplace, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot going on here. Yeah, absolutely. I've, uh, I've definitely looked at uh, some of the uh, content inventories for a number of your sites and uh, they have, there's challenge after challenge. So I'm, I'm sure you face uh, so many different projects every day. Um, yeah, so I, I, I really appreciate you joining us today. Um, and uh, to kick things off, I really wanted to talk about, you know, and ask you from, you know, from where you sit and the research that you've done, um, you know, what, what do you, what do you, how do you define uh, user intent? Um, and how has, you know, the changes that, you know, the search engines have gone through, how has that influenced your research, your applications, your projects, and, and, and everything in between? Yes, absolutely. So user intent is obviously the intention the user has when performing a search. And to put it into easier, even easier terms, I would say it's the problem the user is trying to solve when he performs a search. Mm -hmm. It has become really crucial in SEO over the years to satisfy user intent. So I would say that this development started when Google introduced their Hummingbird uh, algorithm or switched to Hummingbird as, a, as, a, as an engine. Um, and we saw the, the first signs of that already back in, uh, in 2010 when, when Panda was introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, but Hummingbird was really, really uh, changing the game a lot. As in, from there on, Google would really double down on user intent and make sure that pages and sites would fulfill the, the required user intent, which we'll dive deeper into in the, in the next couple of slides and words. However, it has really changed my work and our work, and I would say everybody's work and so far that um, it's, a, it's an absolute pre-requirement nowadays to satisfy user intent and to recognize it correctly also as it changes. And this is also something we'll speak about more over the next couple of slides. Yeah, so how does that differ from your perspective from you know, meaning or disambiguation of meaning? Um, and uh, you know, what are the types of things that you run into uh, you know, clarifying this internally you know, with your writing teams um, you know, to try to just get the definition clear? I know I, I yes. run into that a lot with clients where I'm saying you know, it's not that that word has, is a synonym or it has multiple meanings, all of those things collectively drive, you know, what the intent of the user, you've got to know each of those stages of, of knowledge to, to make the right decision about how to approach a topic. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, so the, the way that it differs from meaning is that specific intents fit to a specific format that people expect. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you just to pick out a couple of examples, if you are interested in any sort of inspiration, mm -hmm. then you probably want to see images or videos, right? If you're interested in something in a, in a very quick piece of information, then you're probably more interested in text across the board. However, it leads us to the, the overarching problem that I'm also trying to clarify with the, the writers and, and creative people that I work with. And that is that user intent often is very specific to the actual query, right? So 
it is hard to say that every query that has word X in it is automatically satisfying a certain intent. That is true in some cases, right? So when, when obviously the, the query contains a word like images or videos, then that's very clear. But in, in other queries, it's not so clear. And so we have to look at the query, look at what Google is showing us to then better understand what people are actually in, expecting in terms of the format. Right. No, that, that's great. And, and we like to reference that as either explicit intent or, you know, hidden or fractured or having a lot of different uh, reasons why somebody would, re, you know, research a particular query that could mean a lot of different things. Um, and so when we get in, we'll get into like how people do these things. And I know that analyzing SERPs, analyzing search engine results pages is one technique. Um, but we'll kind of walk through uh, some other techniques for ways to think about your content and content marketing, too. Um, so just, you know, I know you, you got into, you're just getting started on some of the challenges. Um, I know one of them that, that we've talked about in the past is how do you do topic research, topic based research? How do you do intent based research at scale? Um, how do you do those things today at, at Atlassian? And then what are some of the other challenges that you run into um, internally? Yes, yes, that's a, that's a very uh, great question. So there are three inherent problems with user intent. The first one is that as you mentioned, it is hard to do at scale and we'll talk about how to do it actually. The second one is that it is not always 100% clear what the actual user intent is. Um, and even for Google, that is not always 100% clear. And that is why, for example, on mobile devices, they sometimes ask you directly, did you mean X or did you mean Y? Mm -hmm. So they're trying to, to quantify what the user intent is in some cases. And then the third problem is that user intent changes over time. So there, there are certain queries for which it will be different over time or it will have a certain seasonality. Mm -hmm. For example, the query Independence Day around 4th of July obviously has a very, very different uh, connotation than in December, for example. So these are three inherent challenges. But uh, when it comes down to uh, user intent research and, uh, and how can we actually figure that out at scale, we already danced around it a little bit and, and it comes down to what SERP features Google is actually showing. Mm -hmm. So on a, on a very small scale, when I do keyword research for a query, I basically I Google the query and I look what, what Google is showing. Is it uh, showing maps? Uh, is it showing uh, images, videos, um, or any uh, like feature snippets, uh, knowledge card, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. on, a, on a large scale, right, when we zoom out a little bit, um, we can actually we can actually quantify that by exporting all the different SERP features per query, mm -hmm. and then um, in an article that I wrote, I have a, a whole list of which SERP feature actually expresses which user intent, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously, when you see a uh, a map um, or a, a local integration, then the intent is probably that people want to to uh, to get a a local result or want to navigate somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. If they, if you Google for something or like memes, or if you see an image pack, then it's it's probably something that people have a visual connection to, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this is how we can basically reverse the user intent by looking at the search engine result pages. So you mentioned kind of a, a, a tactical one hundred and one, kind of getting started with user intent as looking at the SERP. And do you see anything special about this search result that might you might be able to glean? Not just the pages that are ranking. But is, is, is Google providing some sort of special experience, like a map, which might lend itself to, to local, et cetera? Um, and so what, you know, referencing that, some people are, 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 are that's, a, that's the limit of the user intent research that you're doing. Um, and as we've discussed, and by the way, Kevin mentioned a, a, a blog post, which I, I very much recommend, and we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the, uh, the follow-up. It's on Kevin-Indig, his site, kevin-indig.com. Uh, there's a couple great articles on uh, user intent profiling and doing scalable keyword research uh, while considering user intent. Um, so uh, one of the, the first one that you published was really, really wonderful. I, I recommend everybody look at it. Um, that's on this, uh, that's on this call. Um, the other piece is though that, like you mentioned, this is just what Google favors for today. That it's, it could be a temporal situation. It could be a seasonal thing. How do you adjust the, to the fact that sometimes in order to be great today or in order to be the most favored user intent of today, you have to build more content than that. You have to tell the story that you actually are an expert 
on all the different things that people care about on these topics. How do you reconcile that with someone that might want to only be focusing on that long tail query or focusing on a, a particular stage of the buy cycle? So what, what kinds of challenges do you, do you run into with those types of uh, situations? Yeah, I think the best expression of the solution mm -hmm. um, is something that I, is a quote that I recently heard from uh, Cyrus Shepard in a video. Mm -hmm. And it was that you don't just want to answer the problem that people come to your site for, you want to answer the next 10 problems that they have. Love it. I think that, yeah, that was brilliantly expressed. And I think that um, this is exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to achieve when I put content in a sequence or in a funnel. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we have a, we have different user intents, but it can be that people try to solve a problem and in, in the solution process, they experience different user intents, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they want, uh, to, to first have a, a visual expre expression of the problem and then sometimes read a bit more text about it. And sometimes they have a simple question about it. Sometimes a little more ambiguous or complicated question. So, mm -hmm. um, all that has to be wrapped up in the funnel, right? And mm -hmm. obviously there, there are they're different expressions or meanings of the funnel. So there's obviously the, the buyer's funnel, which is mm -hmm. awareness, consideration, purchase. Yeah. But then there's also this funnel that people go through where they um, are aware of their problem and then they shape and, and iterate on their understanding of their problem over time. And then also shape and iterate their um, best solution in that case, right? So mm -hmm. there, there are several processes that people go through and you want to create content for every step in that process. Absolutely. Um, in best case, even when they're not even aware that they're having this problem, right? There's a certain, um, a certain phenomenon called serendipity where mm -hmm. we discover something in the unknown, search of your something unknown, else. Yeah, your unknown need, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. The unknown unknowns, right? So, um, you also want to want to try to be even present in that stage until the final solution and until people make their decisions. So when so that is, that's an awesome segue for kind of the content mapping challenge, and that is something that I find you know we we work with teams of editors, uh, teams of content marketers that have search teams uh, you know on them, um, and it's you know how do how do I decide if I'm going to write you know content that appeals to multiple stages of the buy cycle. How do I decide if I need content that's only going to appeal to one um, and everything in between? Am I filling in gaps or am I really going out with a robust, comprehensive plan? Because for example, if I've got great content that tells the story about maybe a pricing consideration on a B2B technology product, um, you know, uh, if I don't have foundational content that tells a story that I am an expert on this you know, on this, maybe it's a CRM software. Maybe I don't have content that tells what, it, what is CRM software, what is the basics. Um, why would I be considered the best place to go to learn about pricing considerations? Um, so when we're talking about content mapping, how do you approach that considering that um, you even have support and you user generated content forums that are probably answering a wild amount of troubleshooting post purchase and all those types of user intent profiles. What, what have you learned from your experience at Atlassian based on you know, working with UGC and user generated content um, in how to guide and map content? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. And it is a fantastic question because I think it's a problem that nobody has yet fully figured out, neither us. Uh, so I don't <laughs> want to give the illusion that we, you know, that we know everything and do everything perfectly. Right. Uh, so some things were also just in, in the process of, of figuring out. But um, content mapping is one of the things where I think we've, we've made great strides and we're in a good place as in, um, I, I, wanna, I wanna highlight a little bit uh, how, we, how we do that. So yeah. we inform content mapping through a couple of sources. One mm -hmm. of them is obviously our understanding of the funnel and the problem and everything that we talked about so far. Another one is through actual user research, right? So we actually talk to our uh, customers, we try to verify that our understanding of their problems is also their understanding of their problems. Mm -hmm. And then in that uh, kind of um, customer feedback process, uh, we, um, we then iterate on, on, on our content mapping and our content in general. Mm -hmm. But then there are obviously also the, the, uh, the quantifiable sources, the data that you can look at. Right? So we pay uh, very close attention to basically three groups of data when it comes to evaluating the 
the the, uh, the performance of our content. Mm -hmm. And the three groups are um, traffic engagement and business impact. So for traffic, we would uh, measure something like rankings, organic entrances, uh, traffic sources, refer us, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then we look at the engagement. Um, so do people share our stuff on social media? Do people scroll all the way to the end of the content? Do they click through other pages on our site, et cetera? And then lastly, we look at the business impact, right? Um, we can, some, there are differences there in terms of um, the actual revenue or signups that we find, or maybe something like soft conversion, something like newsletter signups. Yep. And so this allows us to, uh, to get a good understanding of how well our content works and where we maybe have to refine a little bit, especially across a broad scale or large scale of content. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to, to user-generated content, it gets a bit trickier, but it's actually a blessing and a curse. The blessing is you have, you have a machine that, that constantly generates content and that, that is kind of self-sustaining once you get it going. It's almost like a flywheel, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously in the beginning you have high moderation efforts and you need to, to create a lot of content yourself and engage people. But once that is spinning, people help themselves right they, they they answer each other's question etc cetera, etc cetera. the problem that this creates is that google sometimes favors these threats over the content that we created in certain cases uh, for example our support documentation or help documentation and this is something that we cannot fully control so the art then becomes how can we make sure that in this case we have the best um balance between user-generated content and our own content, right? Mm -hmm. In many cases where we can provide better insights than certain customers, but it also helps us to inform or to understand what problems people are facing. So to, to boil it down to, to specific action items, we actually look very closely at our community and at what people are struggling with and then use that to inform the content creation on our side. So how can we make our support documentation better, our knowledge bases, mm -hmm. uh, or onboarding and tutorials? That is, so you're fo so far ahead of the game. I, you know, we, Mark and Muse, we work, we have a technology that it does content mapping and it also identifies opportunities by looking at large pools of forum content um, and bubbling those, bubbling those concepts up that could be fielded with prose or expository content on the site um, and you, you're very, very much ahead of the game. Uh, what, you know, what I always like to say is if you're looking at a, a great user generated content or a content community, it tells you a lot of the user intent targets of pre-purchase, post-purchase, you know, the desires, the challenges, troubleshooting wing, and you can really build out and learn a lot from your community or from even another community that isn't affiliated with your business about the types of things to cover. It's a real great source for research on how to cover a particular topic. Um, and I thought you said something that was really, uh, really key um, in, in that relates to intent mismatch and engagement is a great way of assessing intent mismatch where somebody you're, you're ranking for a lot of stuff. It might be because you're Atlassian and super powerful. Um, it might be just because, you know, you had one page generate a lot, uh, have a significant link velocity or have a lot of power or one section of pages and really monitoring all the different types of queries that are making it to that page. A lot of times companies will only look at an overall engagement number and they'll say this is 2% conversion rate or 2% click rate, right? Um, but from what topics, from what queries are those clicks coming and are they leading to successful experiences? So many times I see someone looking at this and saying, you know, woe is me. I've got such a low engagement rate, but the query is coming to the page. Your content's not matching the needs of the users, but because of an off page factor or something else, it's ranking. So as people are getting to your, 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 you know, your article about, um, you know, about pricing considerations and you don't have anything about pricing considerations on that page. So what do you do in that situation? You start writing content, and a cluster of content about that if it matters to your business. So that gap analysis through variant tracking um, and through intent mismatch is clutch. And I, it sounds like you're doing that for your UGC efforts and as well as for your, um, you know, for your content team. So that, that's just, that's a pro tip for sure. Um, one other thing you mentioned was what we reference as demand fracture. Um, so where you're finding that variance uh, of keywords uh, that 
explicitly express a need or it's a different type of research profile have a unique amount of keyword volume or search volume. Uh, and so how do you, do you monitor that? Do you think about that when you're saying, wow, um, this head term gets almost as much as this, uh, you know, this variant. Um, and so when you're thinking about intent also, those uh, demand fracture situations can be seasonal as well. They can be something that you should be ready for um, in case it spikes or in case that gets more important. So do you, do you consider that in your processes? Because I thought that that's what you were leading to when you said, uh, uh, when you're doing variant targeting, so yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, the thing is, in, in, in the SaaS industry, right. there's so many in-depth topics that it's hard to be a subject matter expert for <laughs> that you have to be really careful during your keyword research. Mm -hmm. uh, very often, that's another reason for why we <clears throat> fall back to customers, but also uh, pull in subject matter experts, developers, et cetera, et cetera, to understand some of these topics simply better, mm -hmm. right? Because there's some, some really in-depth stuff, and then you find real gems, where, as you said, where a variant of the, of the keyword has actually more search volume, or at least more, <laughs> as much search volume as the uh, short head term. And it's, it signals you, once again, that people are dealing with specific problems, right? Mm -hmm. So when we zoom out all the way, um, I think we also have to be worried yeah. about the industry and the space that we're in. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, um, here, let's, let's just take developers, right? It's one of, one's a very, very important uh, customer group for Atlassian. Mm -hmm. um, and these developers, um, they, they Google a lot, but they Google very specific things, right? right. So uh, it's, not, it's, it's less often that they need to understand what is software development, but often that they need to know something very specific, right? That leads to some, to some of the variants that you were uh, talking about and some of the mm -hmm. variability. Now, um, the way that we address it is to find the right mix between focusing only on search volume and focusing on conversions or qualified traffic and focusing just simply on the subject itself, right? So I think I, I would say that a lot of people understand that you cannot only take search volume, but you also want to get an understanding of how qualified that traffic is. And obviously, there is a certain correlation between lower search volume and more qualified traffic or long tail and more qualified traffic, simply due to the nature that the better people are able to express what they're looking for, the more likely it is that they have a, a specific intent in that, in that problem or in that question. But that should not make us blind to what the whole sequence is of things right. that people search. So we would not shy away to even tackle something that has a super low search volume or almost no search volume, simply to make the experience a little better and to, to inform people all the way. Again, search, search engines are used to solve problems, right? Mm -hmm. But we as, as product developers or, or, or software developers, we also create new stuff that might address a problem that people don't know they have yet. So by definition, that cannot have search volume. Uh, and if we'd only look at that, then we wouldn't create content around it. But we also have that, that, that fraction or that, that percentage of thought leadership content or um, new stuff that people haven't experienced before. And we have to be wary about that as well. So that's what, what I mean when I'm, when I'm saying, look at the topic as a whole and don't mm -hmm. only let search volume guide you. It's a strong indicator, but it shouldn't be the end all be all. Yeah, I, I frequently see teams that only use it as their North Star for every decision. Um, and, you know, the great example I always give on a, from a topic modeling perspective on any specific topic is you're going to have things that if you were a subject matter expert, you would naturally include these related topics in a page that covers this topic comprehensively. And yeah. that is independent of organic search. So I, we, I, you, you'll, you'll see a lot, a lot of times, maybe you'll see the word, you know, blog is in a, a related topic model. And someone's like, well, we're not trying to rank for the term blog. No, that's not the point. The point is if you write great content about content marketing and you don't mention the term blog, it's not all that comprehensive. It's actually giving a negative signal that you truly know what you're talking about. Um, and so the, 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 the importance of doing comprehensive research on what it means to be an expert on this topic, who, you know, that audience resource that you were talking about is so valuable. Um, what are all the, who are all the people that are thinking about this? How do they learn? Are they, you know, children? Are they, you know, developers who have really specific needs? Um, and putting content in front of them that's audience specific, putting content from that covers all stages of either the buy cycle or the learning cycle, depending on what you're doing. 
um, and not limiting yourself only to the buying cycle if you're in a situation like Elastian is. I mean, you said it very eloquently, you know, the troubleshooting um, is, is so key. Um, and those are people that may have already bought anything that you'd ever sell, but you're creating a community of people who are, um, you know, comfortable trading off these like really explicit user intents profiles um, to win. And, and that's, that's super key. I think that a common, um, I know we're going to get into a few, like some myths or some mistakes, but a common mistake that I see is where someone will only include keywords almost like in a stack rank from the keyword tools um, and in their stuff. And, and that completely misses the boat of writing comprehensive content, you know? So, yeah. Yes. I, I couldn't agree more. Mm -hmm. And I think it funnels into a bigger question that is, do I just as an SEO or as a content marketer or inbound marketer, however you, you define yourself, um, do I just kind of blindly take the data or do I go the extra mile and think about it, right? Do I try to, do I have empathy, right? It often sounds empathy. Like, do I, do I actually see the world through my customer's eyes? You, 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 it's like you're reading my diary. I have, I have stuff <laughs> on my wall. It, it literally says empathetic content is good content. And it's, it is, it's about, um, are you telling, are you putting yourself in the, in the potential customer or the prospect or the potential community member's shoes? Uh, when you're making these decisions uh, and um, and what what I what I find a lot of times also and, and I think you mentioned this before when you're doing content mapping um, it's really trying to put all of your content into one bucket or to multiple buckets I see a lot of the the mapping solutions that are out there and they're only you know it's against this funnel that I've got on my screen right here you put this is informational this is commercial but you really got to go a step further to be successful right now I feel You've got to be able to, you know, really critically think who is being satisfied by this page. What am I enabling? What tasks am I enabling? And like you quoted with uh, Cyrus, I mean, yeah, everyone should be reading his stuff. Um, he, he's a he's a he's a fantastic resource for our community. Um, and when he said, you know, the answer answer the next ten questions, build rapport, build rapport with your content, um, and 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 give them that next step. That's the definition of engagement. I mean, that is the definition of engagement is to say, do you, are you smart enough about this topic that you can guide them on their way and build that great resource? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think, I think that that's, that's a, really good, um, uh, a really good point for when you've been auditing large sets of content. I know you probably do fun content audits and inventories all the time. What are the, um, you know, what is the guidance? What comes out of the bottom of, of an audit from Kevin? Um, that, you know, that, that you give to the team and say, this is what we've got to do, you know, as a, as a result of all this research that we've done on user intent. Yeah. So again, we're constantly iterating on our content and I, I don't think, I, th I think it's really hard to get any content perfectly right from scratch. So you right. don't have that expectation that whatever you put out is going to, is, is what should be there forever. Right. So you want to iterate, you want to change, you want to update as well, which Google often rewards. Mm -hmm. When I do an update, I look at a couple of factors. So again, I, I talked about these three groups of metrics before, mm -hmm. but there is there, there are other things that I look at as well. So I have to I have become a really big fan of content pruning, which means to either edit or redirect or remove underperforming content. And so the question becomes, what is underperforming content? Um, and I usually look at it from a couple of perspectives. Um, again, I have these three groups of metrics, but specifically with rankings, mm -hmm. if it doesn't rank anymore for something, or if it doesn't get organic traffic anymore, that's when my red flags uh, you know, uh, come up. And, and that's when I look a bit closer at the content. And so what I often do is I, I take a crawler, could, Screaming Frog, uh, uh, or any other crawler that you, that you like. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I call the whole blog or the whole site and I, and I, I uh, pull all the metrics for the content from the last six to 12 months. So look at how much organic traffic did it get, uh, what does it look like in terms of social shares, engagement, et cetera, et cetera. And then I cluster that into a couple of groups. And then usually you quickly find that about 10 to 30%, depending on how often you do that process, depending on how well you do the content, um, has to be either taken out or edited. And so what I often do is I 
the content's very right. It's a uh, you know, couple of minutes and it, it's not really good. But it's also long content that doesn't really have a clear target or um, isn't, isn't clearly adjusted towards a problem. Uh, so you, you become aware of all these patterns when you compare or when you look at all the pieces of content that aren't performing. So you find all these issues, you, you make a plan, but at the same time, you want to get them out of Google's site first. So in, in a lot of cases, I set them to MetaNo Index or try to, to block them in, in, in some way uh, from Google's access, which is relatively radical, but I have seen great results with that. Um, and then obviously that is not the, the, the end stage. Um, next, you want to um, make sure that somebody looks at that content and reworks it, um, mm -hmm. or you just redirect it. Just redirect it to the homepage if it got some, some uh, links uh, or if it got some incoming uh, uh, referrals from your site. Um, and then you find a more long-term solution for that piece of content. So simply by getting it out of Google's eyes through whatever me method you want, uh, I've seen great results and it almost seems that, or it very much seems that um, the articles or the, the content that's still live actually gets a boost from cutting off the underperforming stuff. And so that's an audit that I, that I perform on a regular basis uh, that I've really come to love. There's, there's so many nuggets in that. I think there's probably people sitting there frantically right now. There will be a replay available after this. Um, what I typically find is, uh, uh, you know, a challenge in that kind of the process that we you just described. They're not, not considering, you said links, you know, you're not considering the off page value um, and not asking that next question. So the, the key on, on auditing for user intent is I like to put myself in the writer's shoes and say, you know, what was the original goal of this article of this content item? And having that document, and that's great if you have a documented content strategy or a content brief that rides along with every page in the first place, um, so you can reference it. Uh, if you don't, then um, you know disclaimer. That's one of the things that we build at Market News. Uh, and uh, the um, you know if you have that riding along with the content item, you can go back and say, oh, that's this was the goal. And clearly, if it's on this in this group, it's not achieving that goal. You know what I mean? Um, so no no rankings, no value. Does it have off-page value of any, of any kind? Does it have links? Um, and, uh, and not just taking all of the buckets and deleting them, or not just taking them all and redirecting it. It's making sure that there, there is a story of why I'm making this decision. I see so often people do blanket, blanket deletes and redirects without examining and doing, and that, by the way, I, for every one story I've heard it works, I've heard 20 sob stories. Um, so you really do have to ask, come up with a great protocol for the things you're looking for and when you'll make that hard decision to redirect, when you'll make the hard decision to prune, or should you be making the decision to say, hmm, the original intent of this article was this, I need to write or rework this page um, and maybe republish it or maybe publish the same URL. So you're making a lot of different decisions during an audit um, with respect to pruning the bad um, that I think a lot of people fall short. They're only looking at um, it as I got to delete stuff. People told me to delete stuff. And that's really, you know, that's where we run into um, a lot of, uh, a, a lot of shaping uh, discussions. It's to say, um, it's, it's to say, think about it. That at one point, somebody put hard work into writing this page. Um, what were they trying to accomplish? Could you do a better job today than was done then? make that choice um, more often than you can if you have the resources. So I think that's an awesome, 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 awesome uh, uh, process there. Um, and like you mentioned with um, uh, user generated content when you're building new content, I think that that was cool too. It was, it was just to say, you know, am I actually providing a better experience for users than that thread was? Or am I doing this for a selfish reason? Um, I know a lot of people who are, who are doing about, they're not putting out as good content as their forum provided. Um, so really think about, think critically about what I, sh what, what would be a great experience for the user? Can I provide a supplemental next step with my editorial content um, and somehow weave it into that experience? So I think that was great. Um, and so we've had a few questions um, and frankly, as we've been talking, some of them got answered. Um, but uh, one question from, uh, from Kelly in the, in the audience is, um, so it's safe to say that the purpose of Google Packs are to target specific user intent. Um, should content attempt to answer that intent with the goal of capturing, ooh, explicit targeting on the image knowledge panel or whatever, should I be writing content targeted specifically to try to achieve a particular pack? So that's a great question, Kevin. There's so much, so much uh, um, uh, controversy in this question is, should I, be, should I be writing definitions? 
you know, th those types of questions I commonly hear. So, so yeah, I'm interested in your perspective here, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a lot of that question. I'm, I'm happy that was asked because mm -hmm. it's, I think it's important in the whole discussion. So trying to answer that as clearly as I can, mm -hmm. I, my, my answer is yes. <laughs> my answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> dun, dun, uh, there's like Slack mastermind channels. Uh, Kevin and I are in a, a couple Slack mastermind communities. There's like, they're going nuts right now. Okay, so Kevin. Yeah, targets, I, I Kevin hope they do. <laughs> You're getting blown up right now. Yeah. <laughs> Um, no. So should you should you be writing definitions? Yes, uh, I, I see. I I are on the side of of yes. I I don't want to just leave you hanging with the side with a with a with the answer that says all oh, depends and blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. There's right. obviously more nuance to it, but generally I are on the side of yes. And what I mean is, we have to accept a couple of realities after my mind. Okay, so the one reality is that Google tries to answer more and more of these questions itself, and it tries to not necessarily lead traffic to sites anymore, but to keep them in the search results pages and keep them coming back for the answers, but you know, miss that last little step, little step. Yeah. <laughs> now that, that's a pretty harsh reality, but what are you gonna do with it, right? It, 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 don't be romantic about your, you know, in the end you're, you still have a business. So should you try to, to rank in certain uh, Google uh, search features, especially direct answers, knowledge graph. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. If that means that you have to make the little adjustments to your content, I'm sure there is a creative way to get around that in every situation. We do it at Lassen as well. We have, we have, we know some of the parameters, for example, that when it comes to featured snippets, you know, it's a certain mm -hmm. length, you have to repeat the question and answer it in the same way that it was posed. But that, that does not rip apart pieces of content completely, right? And Again, there are creative ways around that. Maybe you can add a little banner or, uh, with a box where you give a definition, right? It doesn't mean that your content all of a sudden has to be very dull and very uninteresting. Um, and then uh, at the same time, um, yeah, definitely that it inspired the, the, um, the rich media that you use as well. Again, if you have an image into integration, then you should think about what is the visual aspect that a user might try to to get out of this content. Let's not forget that Google doesn't randomly show these images or the, these, uh, these SERP features, but it shows them because it thinks it has a good understanding of what people actually expect. And you can use that for your own content, right? So don't think of it as competition or it's something that puts you in a box. Think of it as a, a positive constraint, mm -hmm. right? As, a, as, a, as an impulse for creativity and think about how we can address it. I mean, that's, that's what SEO for the longest time has always been. This has, it has been a creative way to give people an answer to their problems. So I would less shy away and be intimidated by these things and more use them for creative input. So yep. yes, I would try to I would try to get into these uh, Google packs or Google SERP features as much as possible. Yeah, and, and I think that that's 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 an interesting you know interesting approach and and things to consider. One thing that I also would 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 uh, add is watching them over time. If it's something that you're really interested, in, watch who keeps bubbling up, and try to consider it almost a competitive analysis of the people who are winning those knowledge packs. Why is this happening? But not just by looking at that page, but look at their entire collection of content that relates to that topic. And it's, is it telling the story that they're more of an expert as I am than I am? Um, because if I can go back into my writing to my writing team and say, you know, XYZ site is getting a lot of early stage awareness uh, knowledge packs. Um, we're not really covering early stage awareness very well. They also cover the other stages of the funnel. Um, and maybe that's why they're getting granted as the, 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 the mecca of early stage awareness content, you know? Um, so I always like to use it as a competitive. And then if, um, if there's a lot of variation in what item is chosen, um, that's me, you know, theoretically, why would that be, you know, but that can give you some, some signals as to, does someone have a stranglehold on this pack and I'm going to burn a lot of money trying to get there or has there been variance over time? Uh, and thus, there is an, a, there's something's in striking distance. It's in striking distance for me. Um, so those are things that I would, I would add that, that would you know, really help the research that um, anyone's doing to try to target. Um, but I think that's it's great advice. I, we did have a follow-up question on our controversial topic of deleting pages, which frankly, I rarely ever d directly delete and redirect. I'm always trying to look for another place for that to live because I'm always concerned that that the, the makeup of the links and the makeup of the inbound links and the makeup of my site structure is telling 
stories that I can't possibly know to the search engine. So I'm going to lose something. I'm always, I, I'm a little bit of a warrior there. Um, and so deleting content without considering the impacts of the site structure or the, it, it, it's, it's a bad idea. So the question from Michelle was, does, won't, if I delete content, won't I just like always lose traffic? Um, and the, if you're deleting it without considering those, those things, and I think you mentioned this, if you're not considering all of the um, components of that, the site structure, where it lives, does, is it passing through value to other pages? Then yeah, if you're arbitrarily deleting, it's gonna have bad, bad impact. Um, but Kev, could you add a little bit on um, kind of when to strategically delete? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I would look at it almost from an algorithm perspective, you know, mm -hmm. so you have a piece of content, does it get traffic? Yes, then don't delete. Look at where traffic is coming from. You know, it's mm -hmm. like a decision tree. Is it come, do you still get traffic from social? Then okay, maybe you, you leave it and you just put it to meta no index. So it, mm -hmm. it's still there, right? It just doesn't get indexed by search engines and you still get traffic from social. You can share it in email campaigns and it, you might link to it internally. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't get any traffic, right? Then the question is, why is that? Is it because it's not targeting a keyword? Is it because it has no links? Is it because mm -hmm. of maybe there's something technically wrong, then you want to fix that. If all these, you know, check marks are uh, ticked, then technically every piece of content should get traffic. So by definition, if it doesn't get traffic anymore, there's something going on, you want to identify why, and then fix that. That is that is the whole uh, idea behind that. So, um, should I help? Yeah. I think, no, I think that, that that's right. I mean, and I think that that's, it, it, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of processes out there, just they err on the side of deleting too much. And I think that that is a problem. If you've got that sequence of steps and you're really, really like, thinking hard before you hit that button, um, you're always usually able to find something that's great. Then you have to figure out if you want to resource it. You know, if you want to resource actually doing this, you know, best perfect plan or otherwise. And, you know, I always find the difference in my, you know, in my content planning in between delete and doing something else almost always falls on, do I want to resource it? Is the, is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, and I think that that's, you know, like you mentioned, that, that, I think that that's top, uh, top, top strike. Um, the other question, I got another good one coming on the Q and A. Um, it was, so, okay. So if you're explicitly writing to those surf features and you win, um, do you risk losing clicks on your organic traffic? because you're surfacing content one stage earlier. I've got a great answer for this, but I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing yours as well, so. <laughs> uh, you built anticipation here, Jeff. I know. Uh, yeah, thanks for the follow-up question, Kelly. Yeah. So um, the answer is yes and no. So what we've seen is that once you are in a Google Pack or in a, in a SERP integration, and usually that's the direct answer or feature snippet, you actually get a lot of traffic still. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, let me take a step back. When do you actually get into a featured snippet? Usually that is only shown for questions or search queries that mm -hmm. have a relatively simple answer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that answer is a sentence. Sometimes that answer is a list um, or a process. Mm -hmm. And so um, very often what we see is that even First of all, some of the feature snippets don't look really good, so you have to click through <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but let's say they all look great. We just uh, lost two Google, two Google participants just just dropped off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on the radar now. Yeah. <laughs> what did you say? Yeah. Can't wait for, for Gary or Don to call me. Yes, exactly. Uh, no, but uh, in, in all seriousness, it, it, let's pretend they all look great. Mm -hmm. um, in, in a lot of cases, people have follow-up questions, and they still click through. Mm -hmm. um, so it becomes more of a winner takes it all situation where whoever is in the feature snippet or direct answer actually gets much more traffic than the other results. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you would still want to uh, want to try to get into those SERP integrations or SERP features um, because it shows that you actually get more traffic in most cases. Mm -hmm. And if it's, I would even argue if it's if it's in an answer that can be, or a question that can be fully answered in the search results pages, then it's questionable how much business impact that keyword for you had in the first place. Now, I'm not saying don't tackle that keyword. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's probably not the situation that is making a lot of money for you, right? So say you, to, to, to try to make up an example on the spot, say you Google the, uh, the soccer World Cup final, um, and who, which teams played in it, right? And you sell 
oh gosh, I don't know, uh, soccer uniforms or something like that, right? <laughs> but the question is how much, you know, how much sense does that make for you anyway, if it's mm -hmm. such a simple answer? No, and I think that that's, that's, that's a great example as well of, a, a, you know, intent mismatch. Are you truly solving the problem just because you knew that uh, France uh, beat up Croatia a little bit? Um, and and uh, so yeah, you get you get into the details of of you know where the you know where the where this comes from, but your 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 bottom line, you know your bottom line of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, we've actually done pretty extensive studies of a couple of SERP features as well, internal studies just to kind of prove things out, similar to the ones that were done, gosh, ten years ago with paid, um, where it was saying if you have the paid and the organic, you're um, you know, multiplying your click, your click through rates. So um, that isn't going to be the case in all queries. Uh, and like you mentioned, if they're very simple um, and we're showing a feature snippet, you there may be a, a degradation in click patterns. Um, if it's not truly very simple, um, it's oftentimes leading to sometimes larger click patterns for us, um, for, for, for sites that we manage, for sites that we manage for our clients. Um, and uh, I think that that's something that also real estate is money, uh, free real estate. If your if your feature snippet looks bad, sometimes that can be very frustrating. Um, but really, real estate is money, and it will have a a, a, a a cascading impact on the performance of the site to get more and more of those things. I would be looking at my entire keyword pool ranking for these pages. Um, how has that been influenced? I'd be looking at click through rates at the keyword level in Webmaster Tools or wherever you have. But however you're tracking them, um, and, and, and try to make a decision on a page by page basis. Uh, are you giving the right landing page? Um, can you learn something from your competitors in that SERP that for new pages to write, um, to maybe get yourself the, the uh, main page plus maybe even two listings uh, to try to just paint the, paint the board with, uh, with your brand. Oftentimes, um, you know, it's, it, it's going to be pretty rare that the, uh, the value you achieve from that is in my, in my experience is going to over, uh, is going to, you know, be, be overshadowed, you know, is going to impact the, the bottom line, um, negatively. Um, so I think your mileage may vary there, especially if there's some huge ordered lists in the SERP. Um, that's the one area where we saw some negative impact where there's just this weird long form ordered list. And like you mentioned, that might be a, a problem. Google would like to solve, <laughs> but that's one, that's one, uh, one, one uh, exception to that and the research that I've done on that. So, but that's a great question too. Um, great. Well, we're, we're getting on the end of time. I really appreciate all the questions and all the comments. Um, any last words, uh, Kevin, on, on user intent profiling or anything that we've discussed? Oh man, we just, there's so many good rabbit holes <laughs> that I want to go down to deeper, <laughs> man. I mean, what, one last tip that I, yeah that I uh, recently formalized is that it don't only limit your research is when you try to figure out user intent or when you try to figure out problems, don't only limit your research to search engines. And I know it sounds a bit counterintuitive in the first place, but don't forget social media where people have discussion over these things and where you can find great stuff. For example, when you, when you uh, check out hashtags on Twitter, you check out Facebook groups or yep. you check out uh, hashtags even on Instagram, right? Let that inspire you and you'll find a lot of interesting, uh, I always find interesting problems that I wasn't aware of before. And then there are also obviously the, the question and answer platforms, the Reddits and the, the chorus of this world. And even mm -hmm. for specific niches, don't, for, don't forget the, the, the specific ones mm -hmm. uh, or forums where people yeah. uh, talk about things. That helps you to create the empathy it helps you to find interesting keywords and queries, and it helps you to find the problems that people really care about because they talk about. Them. Yeah, I mean that's that's the that's brilliant advice, and it's something that we practice uh, all the time. Um, and, and on top of it, even finding subject matter experts in your community, um, in the community that you're targeting, and you know what do they know that nobody else might know, and really getting getting to the bottom. And that research is worth its weight in gold. Um, and and, and so, you know, looking at forums, brilliant advice, looking at question and answer platforms, um, other media, uh, you know, maybe it's media that isn't search engine friendly, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, and that can lead to success with user intent profiling. Um, and so I think that that's a great place to close because that's the best tip of the day. Um, and I really, really appreciate the time, Kevin. I, and, and I wish, really appreciate everybody for joining and lasting. We had almost no drop off rate with the, with the webinar. That's what you're looking for. Um, and Kelly and all the question responders put in the chat that they were uh, very thankful for our responses. 
Um, look for the replay. Uh, you're going to get an a, a email with some show notes, some links. And if you have any questions, send them uh, our way. Um, uh, emails listed in here. And, uh, and we look forward to you, um, uh, you know, joining with us on a future Market Muse webinar. And thanks again, Kevin. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. All right. Cheers.